Amen. Amen, amen, amen. It's a good night to be in church, amen? Come on, students, you excited to be in church tonight? Yes. Fifth graders, you excited to be in church tonight? <clears throat> Somehow they were louder than every sixth through twelfth grader right there, and that's, that's wild to me. Hey, at, at NH Youth, we also do this thing right before we get started called our focus moment. And that's where we take a moment to get on, we get everybody in the room on the same page. And so we're going to do that tonight. And here's what our focus moment is. It is this, every time we meet with God, anything can happen. Every time we meet with God, anything can happen. That means that God is here, God loves you, and God wants to do something amazing in your life. Amen? You guys with us? So because of that, because God is here, and because every time we meet with God, something awesome can happen, something amazing can happen, we are choosing to not be a distraction or be distracted. So what does that mean? That means that you need to, in this moment, this is your time to remove the distractions, right? If you're sitting next to somebody that you are going to distract or is going to distract you, now's your time to move. You're free to do that. You're free to go find another seat. If you have a cell phone in your hand and you know that uh, this is gonna be a distraction to me, I'm gonna use it for the Bible, but in reality, when the first notification pops up, I'm gonna click on it. If you're being honest, right, and you have a cell phone in your hand that's going to be a distraction, this is your moment to turn it off and put it down, okay? If you have a notebook or a paper Bible, this would be your moment to grab your notebook, and if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and begin to turn it to Ephesians 4:17. Because we're going to get there in just a moment tonight. Okay, so is everybody with me? Say yes. yes. All right, let me pray one more time. Jesus, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do tonight. Thank you for what you've already done through singing of songs, God, and all the ways that you've already been moving in our hearts and in our lives. So God, I just pray that tonight as we dive into your word, as we dive into your scripture, God, that we would have an encounter with you that changes us for the better, that changes us, that changes our hearts, that changes our lives, that changes everything. God, we love you. God, we praise you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. It is, I'm going to get to that in just a few moments. You can go back to the first slide. But I love <clears throat> spiritual emphasis week. I love fresh wind. I love that we do this every year as a church at the beginning of the year to refocus us, to get us all back on the same page, to get us all back in tune with what God wants to do in our lives. And so far, we've talked about Jesus, uh, uh, excuse me, we've talked about taking Jesus off of our priority list and putting him at the center of everything in our lives. If you missed that sermon, it's available on YouTube. This was Pastor Luke last Sunday morning when he kicked us off, at, uh, kicked Fresh Wind off. We, we talked about how our relationship with Jesus can't be something that we check off of the weekly to-do list when we attend church on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, but instead our relationship with Jesus has to be where everything in our life flows from. Our actions, our thoughts, the things uh, that we say, it all has to flow from Jesus. Why? He has to be the source of our strength. He has to be where we receive our life from. Why? Because from him are all things and to him are all things. What does that mean? That means Jesus created it all. That means in Jesus is where we find hope. In Jesus is where we find love. In Jesus is where we find peace and joy and true happiness and all of the things. It's in Jesus that we receive the breath of life. It's all about Jesus. And then on Sunday night, Pastor Zach, he challenged us to live in the presence of God. He challenged us to learn how to be in God's presence all the time and to want to be in God's presence all the time. If you missed that message, it will be on YouTube uh, within the coming week. But Pastor Zach challenged us. He, he said that time spent in God's presence is never time wasted. As a matter of fact, it's the best way that we could spend our time. There's nothing better than spending time in the presence of God. Why? Because God created us. Because God loves us, because God cares for us, because God has what's best for us. And it's in his presence that we find healing and freedom and joy and peace and hope. 
And Pastor Zach, he challenged us. He said, we should get homesick when we find ourselves outside of the presence of God. It's all about Jesus. We should live in his presence. And tonight we're going to talk about how do we practically live this out. Because that all sounds good, right? If we were being honest. If we were being honest, it all sounds good. It all sounds super easy to do when we're coming to church, when we're literally in a church building, right, on a Sunday or a Wednesday night. That's easy to do. I can worship Jesus. He can be the center of my life when I'm at church. I can sit in his presence. I can be in his presence when I'm at church. But Pastor August, I have to go to school. I don't want to. My parents are forcing me to go to school, but I have to go to school, right? Yeah, some of you, a lot of, yep, we're feeling that. Adults in the room, you're like, Pastor August, I got a job. Okay, this world takes money to to do things, to survive, to live. I got to go to work. So it sounds super good for you as a pastor to say that we have to do these things, that we have to have this kind of relationship with Jesus. I have have priorities. I have things that I'm obligated to, things that I can't give up on. I'm obligated to extracurriculars. Pastor Argus, I got wrestling. I got volleyball. I've got social clubs. I got all kinds of things happening that I, I can't just be in the presence of God all the time. I can't just sit and and be in the presence like we did last Sunday night. I I can't just do that. It sounds like an impossibility to me. And here's the truth is that you're right. You're absolutely right. In this current culture that we live in, we filled our calendars with all sorts of things. We've filled our calendars with all sorts of things from every aspect of culture. We've completely filled our calendars so that we don't miss out on what there is, on what's happening, right? It's called FOMO, the fear of missing out. So we don't miss out on what's happening. So we try to be a part of everything. We fill our lives with stuff and with activities and with being places. We fill our lives with all of this stuff because the world tells us that's how you have a good life. That's how you have a full life. If you want to be, if you want to, have, you want to be, you know, fulfilled in this world, you know, you got to be a part of all these things. You got to have all this stuff. And the world has convinced us, and culture has convinced us that the easiest thing to cut out of your schedule to make more time is spending time with an invisible God. The world has sold us this lie, and the reality is, if we were being honest. All of us, from the youngest to the oldest, have bought into this lie. Ah, I'm, Pastor Arch, you don't understand, right? My kid uh, has got soccer. I can't be at church because of soccer. Pastor August, you don't understand. I got to get my kid to the school or I've got wrestling super early in the mornings. I got to be there for lifting. I can't. Spend time with Jesus. And no, you don't understand, Pastor August. When I get home from school, I've got so much homework that I have to do. There are no other options. Not even a thing called study hall, right? There are no other options. I have to spend hours doing homework. Or, August, you don't understand. Work is hard. And I worked my nine to five. And I'm tired. And I pay for a Netflix account. And I need to pay for it for a reason. So it's time to turn it on, right? Right? We've bought into the lie that we have, our, our schedules are so full that we have no time to spend with God. And the reality is, is because we've bought into that lie, we are forsaking Jesus and we're in turn putting him on the altar instead of us. We have to remember that the king of this culture and the king of this worldly kingdom that we're living in is the devil who is the enemy of our souls and the antithesis of Jesus who will use every tactic that he can to separate you from Jesus. No matter how good it may seem. Yeah, but if I don't, if I don't play volleyball, Pastor August, I'm going to miss out. But if you don't spend time with Jesus, you're going to miss everything. But Pastor August, if I, don't, if, I don't, if, if I don't get my full eight hours of sleep, I'm not going to be able to function in the day. It's amazing because the Bible says we find true rest in his presence. We have to remember that the kingdom of, uh, of this world, the king of that kingdom is the devil. 
And all he's trying to do is separate you from Jesus because if he can separate you from Jesus, he can convince you that you don't need Jesus. And if he convinces you that you don't need Jesus, he can, uh, excuse me, he can persuade you to follow him. And if you follow the devil, you'll eventually figure out that the path you're walking is leading you straight to death and an eternity separated from your creator. And you'll wonder, how did I end up here? I was just trying to have a good life. I was just trying to do what the world told me to do. So we have to learn how to practically live this thing out. We have to learn how to practically take Jesus from a Sunday service or a Wednesday night and make him the Lord of our lives, the master of our weekdays, and the God who is seated on the throne of our hearts. So we have to choose to practically live a life that follows Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, he says it like this in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do. Pause. What's a Gentile? Right? Some of you read the Bible. I read the Bible. I'm like, what's a Gentile? This doesn't make any sense. Gentiles is an ancient designation for those people who are separated from God. Right? We see all through the Bibles, they talk about Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were the people that were God's chosen race, his holy people. Those were his people. But when Jesus came into the, uh, in, in, excuse me, in the New Testament, when Jesus came and we read about his story, he bridged the divide and there were no longer Jews and Gentiles. The Bible tells us that. But they still use the word Gentile to, to designate the people who are living without God. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody with me? Say yes. All right. Okay. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit of God renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that you need to look different than the world. That tells me that you need to live different than the world. That tells me that a relationship with Jesus means that we can actually live righteous and holy lives. And I believe that there's three ways to practically live a righteous and holy life, and they're very simple, and it's this. Pray, read the Bible, and tell others about Jesus. You want to practically live this thing out, we're going to strip it all the way back to the basics or the fundamentals, as some people would call it, right? All the way back to the basics. Pray, read your Bible, and tell others about Jesus. If you're taking notes, those are my three points, and then we're going to be done tonight. For the rest of our time together, we're going to focus and we're going to talk about these spiritual practices. And then we're going to have time to respond to Jesus and practice these here in this place tonight. So number one is pray. Everybody say pray. pray. Come on, everybody say pray. pray. We have to live a life of prayer. That means taking intentional time every single day to spend time with God. This is not an option. This is a must. We have to choose to spend intentional time with God in prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is simply communion or the opportunity to communicate with God. Every single day we have the opportunity to talk with God. What does that mean, talking with God? That means talking to him and allowing him to speak to us. Every day, we have to develop a routine in our lives of every day spending time with him in prayer. Why? Because this relationship is a real life, alive relationship. 
And when we go to God in prayer, when we take our needs to God, he will respond and he does respond and he speaks to us. And so to effective prayer, we have to not only talk to God, but we have to be able to hear from God. We have to learn to be able to listen for his voice. The Bible tells us we must be quick to listen and slow to speak. We have to be able to hear God's voice, to listen to God. And let me tell you, Sometimes it's the audible voice of God. That's true. But in my 31 years of life, I've never heard the audible voice of God speak to me, but I know that he's spoken to me. You know how? Through what Pastor Weaver calls God thoughts. God thoughts. I've learned to distinguish the thoughts in my life that come from the Lord and that come from my selfish desire. Sometimes uh, he speaks to us through thoughts and, and we have to know how to listen to him and truly actually listen. Do you know what listening means? It means closing your mouth and opening your ears. You can't listen if you're still talking. You can't listen if your mouth is open. To listen for God's voice, you have to actually sit in his presence and listen. It's going to be awkward sometimes. It's going to be silent sometimes. But it's important that we learn how to listen for God's voice. Because when we begin to listen for God's voice, we'll recognize and we'll be able to discern through the thoughts in our, bri- in our brains. No, our brains. It's you, Pastor Brian. We'll be able to distinguish the thoughts in our brains. This is from me, but this is from God. We have to learn to listen. It starts with hearing God and then we speak to God. We ask God to speak and then then we listen. And here's here's a couple things that, that we need to know. If it's a thought from God, it will absolutely line up with scripture. If God is speaking to you, if God is saying something to you, you're like, man, I feel it in my heart. I know that this is right. And you know that it lines up with scripture. Yeah, it's probably from God. But if you're feeling something like, man, this might be from God, and it tells me that I need to hate my neighbor because they stole my lawnmower, probably not from God. Actually, not probably, definitely not from God, right? Man, I'm really feeling some kind of way. I'm supposed to be angry with my friend because we were playing video games, and he just keeps beating me and won't let me win, and I feel like it's from God telling me to go destroy his Xbox. Probably not Mm, definitely not from God, right? Why? Because God tells us we shouldn't hate people, we should love people, right? If it's from God, it's going to line up with Scripture. But if you're feeling something that glorifies yourself, if you're feeling something that is selfish and puts you on top and puts you on the throne, it's not from God. That's the easiest way to distinguish the thoughts of God. Also, if it's, you, you can trust God thoughts because they give you peace and they strengthen your faith. If it's from God, he'll continue to confirm it and you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is what God is saying to me. I know that this is what God is saying to me. Prayer, it makes our ears sensitive to his voice. Prayer, it, it, it makes us sensitive to hearing uh, from his word, to knowing the truth to knowing what God is saying to us all the time. And so we have to learn, just as important, the Bible says bring everything, we're gonna talk about this in just a second, bring everything to God in prayer. Just as important as asking God and bringing our needs to him in prayer is learning how to sit and listen to God. And tonight you're gonna have the opportunity to do that. Because if we're being honest, if I'm being honest, I'm terrible at it. I love to talk. I have a lot to say. Sometimes people think I'm related to Pastor Weaver in that aspect. <laughs> Come on. And when I just had, when, on the times that I've just sat and listened to God, man, I, my, my feet's tapping, my knees are going, I'm playing drums on the table, and I just can't focus. But man, I remember one time I was, I was sitting in, at Lake Geneva Christian Center, and it was after the service, and I was just sitting there. And I had, I had talked to a student, I had prayed for him, and, and we were hanging out, we were talking for a while, and then he left, and I was just sitting there because I didn't want to leave. 
I didn't want to leave, but I didn't know what to say. And so I just sat in silence. And it was in that moment that I felt the Lord speak to me. I didn't hear anything. But I felt the Lord speak to me. And I felt him say, August, this is what I created you to do for the rest of your life is to tell students about Jesus. If it wasn't for me hearing from God, I wouldn't be here today. Prayer, a lifestyle of prayer, it takes intentionality to set aside time every day of the week to meet with God. Because if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. It's the age old truth. If you fail to plan, if you fail to to make a plan to do something, then you're, you're planning to fail. We can't just know that spending time with God in prayer is important. We have to actually do it. It's important to know that drinking water is healthy for you and necessary, but if you never drink water, you're eventually going to die of thirst. You have to actually drink water. It's the same with prayer. It's one thing to know, hey, Pastor August, Pastor Luke, Pastor Zach, all the pastors in New Hope, they keep telling me I got I to gotta spend time in prayer, and I know it's important, I know it's important, but man, I, gotta, I, I got stuff I got to do, this needs to get done, this needs to get done. It's one thing to know it's important, it's a whole other thing to actually do it. It takes intentionality, it takes sacrifice, you have to actually do it. In youth, we use an acronym. So you want to practically know how to pray. Because sometimes we're sitting there like, ah, I don't really know what to do. Should I should I talk? What should I ask for? What should I say? I don't really know. So in youth, we use an acronym for pray, P-R-A-Y. And it's, it's this. The P stands for pause. You want to know what to do when you pray? Pause. Stop what you're doing. Take a moment to kill all the distractions. Set your mind on God. Quiet yourself. Listen for him. Pastor Luke says that it's easy to get distracted, but every time you get distracted distracted is another opportunity to come back to God. And it's in this moment that we pause. We pause and we begin to, to kill the distractions and set our minds on him to think about who he is, which leads us to the R, which is reflect and rejoice. It's only one R, but it stands for two words. I can do that, okay? We reflect on who he is and then we praise or rejoice because of who he is. So we spend time, we pause, we set our mind on him and we begin to think about him and say, man, God, today you woke me up. Today you put breath inside my lungs. Today, God, uh, you made, I made it all the way through the day with you, God. You, you kept me safe on my way to work. You kept me safe on my way home, God. Today, it's all about, you know, I thank you, God, because you're so good, because you, you love me, God, because you, you are so great. You are worthy of all the praise. We, we reflect on him. We reflect about who he is. We think about the goodness of God, and then we praise him for it. We praise him for it. The A leads us to asking, right? So we pause, we reflect and rejoice, and then we ask. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says it like this, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In everything, Let your requests be made known to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That means that if you care about it, God cares about it. There's nothing too small. Bring it all to God, all the the major problems in life, but even just the small things. Bring your needs to God. He loves you so much that he wants to talk to you about it. He wants you to talk to him. He wants wants to know about your life. Bring everything to him in prayer. There's a study that talks about how the same part of the brain that is responsible for anxiety and worry is the same part of the brain that is responsible for gratitude and thanksgiving. Do you know what that means? That means you can't do both at the same time, which I think is fitting why the Bible says Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Why? Because you can't be thankful and anxious at the same time. 
You can't be thankful and anxious at the same time. You can't be grateful and worry at the same time. Your brain isn't created that way. You can only do one or the other. And so the more that you give in to anxiety, which happens when you don't spend time in prayer, the less you will be thankful for what God has done and grateful for who he is. But the more that you give in to thankfulness, right, spending time in prayer, you'll be, and you're grateful for who he is, the less anxious you'll be. That's the brain science behind it. The why is yield. So we pause we reflect, we rejoice, we ask, and then we yield. What does that mean? It means not my will, God, but yours be done. I will pray, and I will believe, and I will have faith, and in boldness, and I will believe, God, with, with big faith that you are good and that you will do what you said, what you would do, but no matter how this thing turns out, your will be done, and I will trust you, I will believe you, and I will be obedient to your word no matter what. We yield to God. Prayer changes your heart and your mind to be like Jesus and to become holy and righteous, just like he calls us to be. That's number one. Everybody say pray. pray. Number two, read the Bible. Everybody say read the Bible. Read. So this goes hand in hand with prayer. We have to have a daily habit of reading our Bible, just like we have to have a daily habit of praying. And oftentimes these happen uh, together, right? Right? We pray and we read our Bible and we pray and we read our Bible. We pray and I read our Bible. Sometimes you may call this devotion time and that's great. That's good. But it goes hand in hand with prayer. We have to have a daily habit of reading our Bible so that we will know Jesus and be transformed by his truth, the only truth. There aren't multiple truths out there. Jesus is the one and only truth, and the word of God is the one and only truth that we can stand on and that we have to build our lives on because every other truth, so and so, truth out there will fail us every time. And so it's, we have to know the truth. We have to know the word of God. Just as our physical bodies need food and water for nourishment and growth, our spirits need spiritual nourishment from the word of God and time with him in prayer and reading the word to grow and become righteous, holy, and whole. If you want to practically live this thing out, if you want to see the change in your life that you've been praying for, if you want to see God move in mighty ways, students, adults alike, we have to choose to do this. Intentionally choose to sacrifice something so that we can be the people God has created us to be. So that we can spend time with him in prayer and reading the Bible. Because it's only through our time with Jesus that our hearts are transformed, our minds are transformed, and everything changes with him. And we know that Jesus said, he told the devil while he was being tempted, uh, man does not live by bread alone. And that, that's a callback, that's a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, which completes that truth. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Do you know what that means? It almost means he's telling us just as important as eating, it is to read the Bible. Every time you eat, you should read. If you're gonna eat breakfast, you should probably read the Bible. Jesus is telling us, man does not live by bread alone. You still need bread, right? We still need food. We got to nourish our bodies. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God, it's just as important to be in the word of God. And that means that every time we open up the Bible, we're opening up God's mouth and we're allowing his truth to be spoken in our lives. We have to choose to read the Bible. And when we choose to spend time uh, filling filling up with other things instead of God's word. We are putting our relationship with Jesus on the altar and we're telling him, I'm willing to sacrifice you more than I'm willing to sacrifice my will and the things that I want to do. And when Jesus is on the altar and we're on the thrones, we are separated from him eternally. This takes intentionality. 
You have to make a plan to read your Bible, and you actually have to act out your plan. This takes sacrifice, but it's completely worth it because time spent with God is the best way that we can spend our time. Worship team, you can come. That was number two, read your Bible. Number three is share Jesus. Everybody say, share Jesus. The final way to practically live out our relationship with Jesus is to share him with the world. Share him with the world. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came. This was after he had died and, and rose from the dead. He's about to, risen from the dead, excuse me. He's about to go back to heaven. He comes and he's having this conversation with his disciples, his followers, the people who believe in him. And he says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's impossible to tell people about somebody that we don't actually know. Because if we take this to heart, Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. You know what that means? We have to know the commands he's given us. And we will never know the commands he's given us if we aren't spending time in his word and in prayer. That means that sharing this third practical, sharing your faith with people, sharing Jesus with people, it can only happen when we spend time in prayer and reading the Bible. Because it's completely impossible to tell somebody about somebody that you never, that you don't actually know. You may have come to church your entire life. Students, you may have been raised in the church from, from when you were born till now. You may have been forced to come to church with your mom and dad. You may like it. You may have t attended all the Sunday school classes, all the Wednesday night services. You may have gone to all the youth conventions and the youth camps. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus that goes outside of church, you don't actually know him and you'll never be able to tell somebody about him. And when you are unable to tell somebody about Jesus, you are unable to be obedient to his word. Because his word tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. That's the call all of us have on our lives. You wanna know what your purpose is? To tell people about Jesus, to love the world. Even those who are hard to love, and that only comes from when you allow the truth of God's word and the truth of his presence and the power of his presence to change your heart and your mind, to see people the way that he sees people. You have to choose. You have to choose. When we put Jesus at the center of everything and we sacrifice daily what we want to spend time in his presence through prayer and reading his word, he changes our hearts, he changes our perspective so that when we go out into the world, we see people the way Jesus sees people with a broken heart and an ambition to share his hope, love, grace, and mercy with them. This is where we live out our obedience to him. Because Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. And then his brother James in chapter one, verse 22 says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Pray, read the Bible, and share Jesus with the world. It really is that simple. Everything else falls into line. That's truly how we, we foster a culture of joy. This is how we cultivate a culture of joy. Jesus, others, you. If it's all about Jesus, if it's all about Jesus, then we'll spend time with him in prayer. If we're making Jesus the center of our lives, then we'll sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed so that we can daily spend time with Jesus.
It's a must. And if it's our reality, then that's, that's what we have to choose. Jesus, others, share the word. Share Jesus. Share him with the world. Tell them about the hope that you found in Jesus and in you. When we, when we do all of that, we put him at the center of our everyday lives, we share him with others, he changes and he blesses us. It really is that simple. It really is that easy. Would you stand with me all over the place tonight? Tonight, alter our response. We're just going to take time to practice this. We're just going to take time to practice this. And so I don't know where you're at in your walk with Jesus. I don't know what you need individually, but you do. You may be here tonight and you may, you may be saying, Pastor August, I, I need to cultivate prayer in my life. I need, to pra- I, I need to do that. I need to practice that because I'm not good at it. This is your night to start. We have plenty of time for you to be able to just sit in his presence, for you to be able to just be in his presence, to learn how to communicate with him, but then to also sit here and and listen for his voice. And he may speak to you audibly, but he also may speak to you through God's thoughts. And tonight you have plenty of time and opportunity to learn how to do that. And so I'm challenging everybody in the room. If you're here tonight and you would say, I need to cultivate a prayer life, I need to cultivate what it looks like to actually spend time in the presence of God. This altar is open. He's here. This room is open. Take the time. Take the moment. If you don't know what to do, remember our acronym, pause. Reflect on who he is. Praise him for who he is. Ask him about the things that you need and then yield and be obedient to him. So if you need to cultivate prayer, this room is for you. This room is for you. If you need to, if you're here tonight and you say, Pastor Alex, I need to start reading the Bible. I need to start reading the Bible. I'm not good at reading the Bible. I need to start and I need to figure out how I can do this every day. Then here's what I would challenge you to tonight is that you would open your Bible and you would begin reading John chapter one. John chapter one. And then when you finish reading John chapter one, if you've got a piece of paper, maybe you gotta pull out your phone and use the note on your phone, notes app on your phone and read the Bible on your phone. When you're done reading John chapter one, I would write down what's one thing I just learned about God from John chapter one. And then when you're done with that, for the rest of the time that we have, I challenge you to go back and read John chapter one. And when you get to the end of John chapter one, You would go back to your notes app and you would write down what's another new thing I just learned about God. Why? Because you're developing a practice in your life to say every time I open up God's word, I can learn something new. Every time I read the Bible, I can learn something new. Because the Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning. That means that we have the opportunity to learn something new about God every single day. And so if that's you, you need to cultivate a a life of reading the Bible, a lifestyle of reading the Bible, then do that tonight. Practice that tonight. If you're here, you would say, Pastor August, I need to share Jesus with someone. I believe that God has already put names on hearts of every person in this place that you need to share Jesus with. If that's you, you say, Pastor August, I, I need to share Jesus with someone, then The best place for you to start and the best way for you to start sharing Jesus with them is praying for them. And so my challenge to you would be this. Respond to Jesus at the altar, somewhere in this place, away from distractions, and begin praying for that person by name. Begin praying for that person. And as you pray for them, ask God to to give you opportunities and to show you opportunities to share his hope and his goodness and his love with them. 
So I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know what you need tonight. But that's how I'm going to challenge you to respond. Pastor Weaver has something he wants to share. Yeah, you may know, like, you feel like you hear from God a word to give. This is the weirdest one I've ever given. But it's like this. It's like, hey, come here. And God's saying that to every one of you. Come here. Thank you, Pastor. So right now, the worship team is going to continue to play. And this would be my challenge. Is that I'm going to pray over the room. And then when I say amen, my challenge would be for you to spread out all across this room. And respond to the altar. Come find a spot up front. Find a spot somewhere that's away from other people so that you can have a moment with Jesus. If that's cultivating a prayer life, if you need to actually spend time reading the Bible, if you need to share him with somebody and you need to pray for that person, you need to begin by doing that tonight. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. We have plenty of time. So let's pray. God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're saying in this place. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness, God. I pray that as we respond to you, Lord, as we begin to practice these principles, God, we begin to practice these ways of living to live out this life that you've called all of us to, that you've given all of us the opportunity to live. God, I pray that we would find you and that our faith would be strengthened and our relationship with you would be deepened, God, and we would know you more, greater today than we did yesterday. So God, I'm asking that you would speak to each and every one of us again tonight. Let us have an encounter with you right now in this morning. Jesus, it's in your name. Begin to move all across this room. Begin to respond, begin to spread out, get away from the distractions. You don't need to leave. We have time. I'll come up and dismiss the room when it's time to go. But let's begin to respond to Jesus right now.